Okay, well, I'm glad to see so many people here this morning. And uh, some new people in the back there. That's very nice to see. And uh, so I'm looking forward to getting into the study this morning about the book of Revelation. Let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee again for this opportunity to meet together, Lord. Open the scriptures. We thank Thee for the word of life. And especially this morning, we think back those 15 years to the time of this great attack on this nation when so many people were killed, so many families uh, under bereavement, and the pain of that still continuing uh, to this day. Lord, we pray for the nation that they would be united against the terrorism that is in the world and that as a country would go forward in strength. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, yes, you can't help but think about September 11. And um, I remember in New Zealand, when this occurred, it was surreal. That's the first thing that, that comes to my mind. It was like, no, this is not happening. What we're seeing on the TV is a Batman movie, or a Superman movie, or something like that. You know, it's not really going on. This is something fake. And then as the realization came in that no, this is not fake, this is real, then the world changed. Immediately the whole world changed. It's a different place now. Totally different. And we see it in our travels. Uh, Seppi, I and Ruben, we went to, for a trip across Europe over the summer and the effects are very evident there of the effects of the uh, rampant terrorism and what's going on in the world. Uh, and, you know, when you look at uh, the lessons that we should have learned from 9-11, we have to say that very few lessons have been learned. This is the sad part about it, that uh, the Americans seem to be more divided and we have uh, some people siding with a philosophy that is going to destroy the world if it continues as it's going. And uh, Americans are unfortunately hoodwinked into accepting all kinds of political correctness. Um, I'll, be, I'll put my vote into the hat. I hope that Trump wins. Now, I can't vote. Do I think that Trump is a great guy? No, don't think he's a great guy. But he's infinitely better than the alternative. That's just how it is. It's just the way it is. Well, I'm a foreigner, so I can't vote. <laughs> So I've just got sort of got to passively look on, but I can influence, you know, I can still influence. <laughs> so anyway, well, we've been studying the book of Revelation, and um, the book of Revelation certainly is an interesting book. Oh, well, that's working. Nothing else is working. But the book of Revelation certainly is interesting because it talks about a time which is to come on this earth. And, um, you know, you look, you look at what's going on in the Christian world and you have to be a, a bit dismayed about what you find. And so I want you to just have a... We want to just look at a few passages just to warm ourselves up to the study. And the passage I want you to look at is this one here, which is in um, Matthew chapter 15. I want to get a little bit of context to our study. What's the context? So if we, if we want to find uh, context, uh, then we need to read around. We need to go here a little, there a little. We need to look for context by reading the Bible and seeing the subject and seeing who is speaking and to whom he is speaking. Who is speaking and to whom he is speaking. So context, you see, is important for everything. If you take a snippet out of what I say, man, you could really, you could add your own context and make me say something that I never, ever intended to say. But if you take what I say and you put it into its background, into what I have been developing to, well, then you can honestly talk about what I said. But if you take something out of context, 
Well, you can teach a whole raft of manner of doctrines of devils. You can. Now, let's have a look. I'm going to draw this little picture. It's a, it's a common picture that I draw. But this is a timeline. Now, you might say, well, what's that? Well, it's kind of like a map. When we got off the train in Germany at the Hauptbahnhof, Hamburg, I looked at my cell phone. I said, come on, work, work, work. <laughs> I needed a map. Big time. We got lost for about half an hour. <laughs> anyway, so context is certainly important. So if you look back here into the, the book of Matthew, we'll have a look at Matthew 15 and see if we can get a little bit of context here. So in, in Matthew's gospel, which is the first gospel of the New Testament, we find the writer saying some things which I think are kind of interesting. This is uh, Matthew chapter 15, and we're around about 24. And I'll back up to verse 21. It says this, Then Jesus went thence and part departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now I notice something about this. First of all, this is a woman who's crying out for help. And notice when she approaches Jesus, notice the reference. Lord, O Lord, thou son of David. Now the Lord Jesus Christ came to fulfill prophecy. And he came as the son of David. He did. And therefore, this hooks you into all the promises to do with Jesus. These are prophetical. This relates to what Isaiah said and what Jeremiah said. What the minor prophets said. And it says this, My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Okay, she's in trouble. Her daughter has this devil and she's out for help. I want help. But notice what the Lord said. But he answered her not a word. Oh man, this is, this is, this is a little bit uh, different. I mean, isn't the image of the Lord Jesus Christ that you have one that says, well, you know, Jesus, he's going to listen to everybody, right? He's always there. He's always ready to listen to everybody. But here it says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See that in verse 24? Let's just back up a little bit and read that verse 23 in full. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Meaning, oh, look, just answer her wishes and, you know, send her away. Just in essence. And then it says in verse 24, But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No, I'm not, I'm not going to answer her. I'm not going to deal with her needs and what she's coming to me for. Why? Well, she says right here, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I first got saved, I would not be able to fully understand that passage right there because the preaching that I was getting from the pulpit would tell me these beautiful homilies. You take one verse out of the Bible and then you stretch it out, man. Stretch it out. Beautiful stories. la dee da Beautiful. 
I mean, I couldn't even produce anything like these smooth sermons that I used to hear. And I'd come back from that and think, well, yeah, okay. And, but when I'd read it for myself, I'd say, I can't understand that. What do you mean? I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, look at verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Okay. She's persistent. and She worships the Lord. But he answered and said, look at this. It's not meat. That is, it's not right. It's not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to little doggies. <laughs> wow. Is this the picture of Jesus that is thrown out in these beautiful homilies? That Jesus, he's always ready to listen to what you have to say. And he'll listen to anybody because, well, that's what the Gospels say. But the Gospels, when you read it, they look a little bit harsh. And you go on reading, and she says in verse 27, and I'm, see, I'm trying to get the context here. I don't want to take a passage and run away with some false doctrine. I want to understand the context. And it says this, and she said, Truth, Lord. Well, here is this little doggy, and she says, Truth. I accept what you have just said as being true. Do you? <laughs> oh boy. You see, one of the things about this church, and one of the things that I love about this church, is that we've come up against the, the coal face. You know what I'm saying? We've hit the coal face. Have you ste seen a steam engine really running? If you go to, oh, there's lots of places around the world that have these still running because they're interesting, you know, and they often these steam engines, they're put into tugboats or they're put into ferries and they're there just for interest so that tourists will come in and they'll, they'll, they'll walk down to the engine room and there you'll see this guy and he's, he's sort of just got a singlet on there and it's undershirt and he's throwing this coal into this boiler man and he's doing it all the time you can see the flames and the the conrod and, and everything's exposed you can see the the movement of the engine woof, woof, woof. it's a very fascinating thing to see if you're interested in mechanics and here we are seeing something which is pretty harsh you're seeing the engine you're seeing the sweat you're seeing someone who's got a real need and coming to the Lord, and the Lord's first movement here is to actually say, no. Wow. That's different, don't you think? That's a bit different. And uh, verse 27, and she said truth, but she accepts this. Why would that be? It says, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So this Gentile doggy acknowledges her place as being under the table man eating crumbs. Is that where you're having your meal as a Christian today? Is that where you're having your meal? under the table is that the way the Lord is dealing with you today that's my question to you <laughs> now the moment you begin to ask yourself questions like that something happens lights start to come on what's the difference in this church relative to other churches well we're prepared to ask these questions and front up to them that's what's different. Yeah, we enjoy praise of God and the emotion of knowing salvation. If you're not emotional about knowing that you're saved, man, what's happened to you? Of course you're emotional. I'm emotional about the fact that I'm saved. 
I've got a resurrection coming for me, man. I'm going down, but I'm coming up. Right? And that's reason to be quite emotional. That's a good reason. But here's the thing. I want that emotion to rest upon knowledge. Knowledge, man. That's what I want. I want to first of all have knowledge so that when I show off my beautiful emotion and someone says, wait a minute, wait a minute, Wayne, how do you know that's true? Well, then, okay, then I'll bring myself out of the emotion and I'll, I'll come back to the scriptures and I'll show you why. But if all you have is an emotion and all you have is some sort of religious piousness that you are fulfilling the Westminster Confession or something like that, as he pulls down the microphone, then, my friends, you are in trouble. You are headed for a disaster in your spiritual life. Because sooner or later, you will have to face up the facts. Why not face up to them now? That's what we want to do, okay? Well, that's kind of interesting, don't you think? So one of the things you can see already is back here in Matthew and in the Gospels in general, what you have is you have a place where Jew here is given a priority. There's no doubt about it. They have got a priority. What else is going on back here? Well, let's have a quick look. Just have a look at this passage with me. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 10. Since we're in Matthew, let's just have a look around in here. This is Matthew chapter 10. And we'll begin reading it around about verse 1. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because the book of Revelation talks about things in relationship to the Jew. Now, it involves the nations, but it is primarily about... Israel and the time of is Jacob's trouble. Israel. Matthew 10 verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Well, that's kind of interesting. First of all, I'm a bit of a num numbers man, right? So I, I just see this. You know, I see in... Uh, Back here in Matthew 10, we have 12. 12? Why 12? Well, let's see. Maybe it's because there are 12 tribes of Israel. Did you ever think of that possibility? That the reason why there were 12 disciples is because there are 12 tribes of Israel. You shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's why there were twelve. Do you see how very Jewish things are looking in the Gospels? They are very. Notice also that these people are going out and they're involved with this healing ministry. All kinds of signs and wonders are theirs. You notice it says that. And it says in verse 2, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, the brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. He was replaced later on by someone. Now, as you go on down further, it says in verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Je... What? Does your Bible say, Go not into the way of the Gentiles? Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Wait a minute. That's you, isn't it? That's me. Now, if I come to this book here and I read this and I say, this is my meal for today, first of all, I ain't getting much of a meal. It's not going to be number two at Brahms. You know what I'm saying? This 
is crumbs under the table for you as a Gentile. Right? Let's get that straight. Right off. Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But, where do you go? Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, oh man. Now, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, for me at least, that is an eye. The eye is getting wider. Light bulbs are coming on. Well, if this message here is primarily to the Jew, we know that something else happened after this, right? I mean, after here at Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was given. Well, surely now what we're going to see is the Jew is out of the picture, right? Well, during this time here, this is Acts, okay? So if we go right out to Acts 20 and 28, and verse 20, this is the last chapter of the book of Acts. So right here, surely what we're going to find here at Acts 28, 20 is something of a big change. Well, let's have a look. Let's go right across to Acts chapter 28. You say, why, am it, what, what on earth is going on here? What are you trying to show me? I'm trying to show you that if you treat the Bible as a glorified buffet meal, you're going to get crumbs under the table. You'll go to passages which say, well, Jesus said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You're going to get doors closed on you if you don't watch out. Acts 28. Look at this. This is kind of interesting. So we're going right across to the end. So this there's 28 chapters in the book of Acts. And that gives us a good indication of what happened after the cross. And if you go right down to verse 20, it says, For this, this cause therefore have I called for you to see you. Now who are these people? Uh, we'll look at verse 17. It came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Okay. So now he, what he does from the Roman prison, he, he calls the, the Jews together. Okay, it says here, the chief of the Jews. Verse 20, for this cause therefore have I called for you, that is the chief of the Jews, to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Well, that means, I mean, if we're reading back here and he's put in, put in ch chains for the hope of Israel, and that takes us to chapter 28, it shouldn't be too much of a hardship in your mind to understand that Israel is still prominent here. In fact, it's Jew first and then to the Gentiles. So here it's exclusively Jew and then over here it becomes Jew first, then Gentile. Well, what if we go to 28.28? What does that say? Well, if we go to 28.28, which we're getting close to the end of the chapter, let's hope that something changes. Please! Something must change so that we are going to see something that is for us. Right? Let's see whether he sees something that's uniquely for us. It says this. Be it known therefore unto you. And if you read the context, this is after the pronouncement of Isaiah chapter 6, 9 and 10. Judgment on Israel. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. Unto the Goyim. The Goyim, man. The Gentiles, the nations, that's us. Barbarians. <laughs> that's us, man. So we get right over here to 2828, right at the end of the book of Acts, and finally, here we are. Rock and roll, man. 
Here we are. Finally, the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. Well, that's right at the end. So what's, what's going to happen here? Well, Paul's in prison, isn't it? Isn't that where we leave, Paul? So surely what is given to us as Gentiles must start with Paul the prisoner because that's how it ends, right? It ends with Paul being in prison. And then the next thing is, what are we after? We are after looking for a message to us by Paul the prisoner. Well, where are we going to go to get that? Well, some will say you should go to Romans. Well, that won't work. How do we know? Well, just look at this with me, please. Romans 1, 16. Look at it. That's not going to work, my friends. Friends, Romans, countrymen. Romans chapter number 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Yeah, cool, man. That's it. That's it. Hold the phone, man. Didn't we start with talking about context? Context, man. Keep reading. It says this. To the Jew first. Oh, man. And also to the Greek. And also to the Greek. But it is the Jew first, is it not? In Romans. So where are we going to go? Well, just why we're in Romans. Let's, let's just have a bit of a look around. Look at Romans chapter 15 with me. Romans chapter 15. And verse number 19. Well, I'll just back up a little bit more because it's quite interesting here look at verse 8 Romans 15 verse 8 now I say now I say man now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers Hold the phone, man. Right here in Romans chapter what, uh, chapter number 15. We have a statement that says in verse 8 that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Well, isn't that what we saw? We saw that in Matthew. We see that going on. Let's go across to verse 19. Look at it. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Ho! Oh, mighty signs and wonders. What did we read it down here in Matthew 10? Didn't the disciples go out with these miracles and all these sort of things? Do we see them continuing all the way through here? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. They're all there. Paul's got them. They're happening to the Corinthian believers. Yeah, yeah. It's all there. Signs and wonders. Why? Well, because the Jews require a sign. Why? Because Jew is first. Why? Because he's trying to reach Israel. But when we get to the end of the book of Acts, something changes, man. They were given an opportunity through the witness of the Holy Spirit to repent. And what happens? Well, we can read through here and we'll find that they're not repenting. They don't want it. They rip their shirts open. Boom! Throw dust up in the air. We will not have this man to rule over us. So, Acts 28, 28. The salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. They will hear it. Cool, man. I'm beginning to get it. Let's go across and find something out. Let's, let's find an epistle written by Paul in the period in which we live. See what he says now. This is in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Okay, so 2 Timothy, chapter number 4, 
and verse number 20. Seems like a small little verse. What has this got to do with us? Well, look at this context. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Well, wait a minute. In the book of Acts, chapter 19 and verse 12, back here, you read in verse 12, Paul is issuing handkerchiefs and aprons to people, and when they receive these things, their sickness disappears. This is in the book of Acts. But when we jump across the border, that's Acts 28, 28. When we jump across here, Trophimus, have I left at my Letum sick? Something happened there. Something happened at the boundary, man. Rational. What's going on? I want to see your papers. What's going on? Something happened. Oh, no, nah, it doesn't matter, you see. Hey, you can drive on the left-hand side of the road or the right-hand side of the road. Take your pick. It doesn't matter. If you go across a boundary between two countries, you better be careful of some of the laws. You better get sorted about law changes. And when you come across this boundary and you go from one to the other, things change. Now, people never taught me this when I was at church. And I became very disillusioned about Christianity. I'll be honest with you, man. And I saw people come to my door. They had a briefcase in one hand and they had a friend next to them, all nicely dressed up, smooth. And who were these people? <laughs> I come from the Kingdom Hall. And I'd like you to read this little magazine here. And then we can start a little Bible study. And who are you? Oh, well, I, was, I used to be a person that went to the assembly of God. But now I've come to the Jehovah's Witnesses. What do we see happening? We see people who profess faith in Christ. And because they do not come to understand the Bible... They get hoodwinked into some cult and they're used by some cult. They'll spend their whole life and their earnings and their time wasted on some ridiculous cult. They started reasonably well. They understood salvation by grace and then they realized they couldn't understand the scriptures and someone knocked on their door and showed them an awake. And off they went to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jehudai Witnesses. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does this matter? Or do you want to go through your life like this? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I'm very happy that I know Jesus, but the rest I, I don't care about. I don't want to understand the Bible. That's too complicated. I'll leave that alone. No, friends, you need to understand the scriptures. Let's have a look at another scripture here, right? So we've seen Romans. Well, that's right. Romans is written during the Acts. Well, let's find another one. How about Galatians? You like Galatians? I like Galatians. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Okay, so Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, there's an interesting doctrine there about faith and about law. But one thing we do get out of this is that during this time, to the people whom Paul was writing, there was a ministration of the Spirit which involved miracles. Miracles. It happened, my friends. Do you find that in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians? Yes, you do. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. 
There it is. All of these miracles and signs and wonders are going on. And yet, my friends, when you jump the border, things change. Why do they change? They change because Israel was judged here at the end of the book of Acts. Now, it comes to our study on Revelation. What are we going to do with the book of Revelation? Well, Revelation takes up the story to do with Israel and the promises to do with Israel. So therefore, we should not be in a hurry to take things that were given to Israel and try and make them apply to us today. You say, what? Yeah, okay, let's do it then. Let's, have you ever done proof? you done, you guys down here, you've done some mathematics, right? Yeah, you've done some mathematics and you're still doing some mathematics, I hope. <laughs> okay, there's something in mathematics we call proof by contradiction proof by contradiction where you make an assumption and then you build it into the fabric of your logic and if your logic is sound and you get a contradiction that means the assumption you made must be false because your logic was true your mathematical logic was true so therefore the assumption you made must be false well let's do something like that now so let's assume that the same things are going on in the book of uh, 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 Revelation as you will find Paul giving us, in, in, say like Ephesians 2. Do you know what Ephesians 2 verse 8 says? I'm sure you know it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Beautiful. Okay. Now, that's what Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 8. Now let's go across to the book of Revelation now and look at chapter 2. Revelation 2 and verse number, let's see, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him that overcometh. Cometh. So if you overcome, then you get to eat of the tree of life. The implication is, if you don't overcome, you don't get to eat of the tree of life. Let's go on a little bit further. Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. <laughs> Uh-oh. Does this sound like... For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, how do you reconcile this? You've got to reconcile this, my friends, because we live in this age, man. This is the age in which we live here. And Paul the prisoner tells us things pertaining to this age. If you want to learn about the age to come, there, yeah, then you can read John's work to Israel in the book of Revelation. Is this cool or what? This is cool, man! This is what is the beginning of the change that came to me as a Christian. Okay? What happens to you in life? You walk along in life's passage, you may be raised in a Christian home and you've heard all this stuff and oh... <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'm cool. Uh, you just believe in Jesus and you're saved, but, you know, really, pff, I, I'm just going to do my own thing, really, you know. Then later on in life, what might happen is you really start to see things in your own life. You start thinking for yourself. And then you make the real decision. You say, yeah, I'm lost. I'm lost. I know I'm lost. And then you get saved. You trust on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And you truly then get saved. Great. Then the Bible really matters. It really matters now. And then as you read the Bible, you get confused. You don't know what's going on. Now let me tell you, the next thing that better happen to you is that you come in contact with some hard, fast, straight doctrine. Because if you don't, you're going to get Horribly screwed up in your life. You need right division, man. That's what you need. And that's what's going to give you that tremendous blessing. The next 
big move for you as a Christian is to understand right division. Then when you come to understand to talk about the harvest in relationship to the age to come, then it makes sense, man. It's going to make sense. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very confusing. And you'll get all manner of... Let's face it, there's so many preachers out there, man, and they're preaching all sorts of stuff. They're saying, come over here, come over here. You need to get some understanding so that you don't need to listen to me or anyone else. You can come to the Scriptures and, and understand it for yourself. The, the sermon or the lesson or the teaching that gives you back your Bible, that's where the truth is, right? The truth is going to come where you're giving the Scriptures back to you so you can understand them. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee today for the truth of the Word of God. We pray, Lord, that it's, this has been a meaningful message for all and that we would be encouraged and that we would be built up by it, Lord. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.